All right, episode 25 of the Making Noise podcast. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what led to this podcast, what led to me starting the podcast, I should say, because I think this episode is entirely connected to that initial idea. Um, Before I thought of having the podcast back in October of 2020, I was... I was having a lot of uncertainty and concerns about my career as a musician, as a composer, Um, you know, not knowing if I was even going to be making any money at all. And uh, it was challenging. And the way I was feeling in my personal life and the way I was experiencing things was affecting my professional life. And so then I realized how much our personal lives inform our professional lives and vice versa. And we talk a lot about having a work and home life balance. Uh, And there is some, there is obvious separation there, but there is also some overlap too, especially as artists, because the music we create is incredibly personal. I mean, even the program notes for a piece of music could be something literally personal to your own life. Uh, And if it's not, then the process or the challenge that we have to go through to create that music is incredibly personal. And then when we finally present it, the vulnerability of that presentation, you know, here's this thing that I created, right? I wear my heart on my sleeve. So thinking about the fact that we're all experiencing the pandemic, I knew undoubtedly that other musicians were experiencing the same things I am, or I was still today, still experiencing it. Hasn't changed. (laughs) Um... So I decided, let's have some honest and open conversations about this stuff, you know? That's why I started the podcast. This episode is probably the closest representation of that initial idea. New York City-based composer Beata Moon is experiencing that right now, that uncertainty, that concern about her career. Um, She told her story in a... NPR radio show about experiencing adverse effects from the COVID vaccine. And she's received quite a bit of backlash about it too. Being labeled an anti-vaxxer and all these things that is very uncharitable, which even in the article, she makes clear she had full intentions of being fully vaccinated. And because of the mandates in New York City, it makes the prospects of her career um, much more uncertain. And so this conversation, um, I want to make it very clear, this conversation is not about whether one should or shouldn't get vaccinated. It's simply about being able to have these conversations, right? Um, One of my favorite comedians, Mark Normans, uh, made a joke recently. It was something along the lines of like, Nuance is the new N-word, right? Like, the, like nuance is completely gone. No one wants to hear the specifics, the specifics of any given situation, why something took place. They see a headline, they freak out without even understanding what happened. And so um, that's why we're having this conversation. We're hoping to find and establish some sort of middle ground. Um, of course, this is coming from her experience. So... This is an opportunity for people who might not agree with something like this to see that perspective, to understand her perspective. Um, You know, at one point, I think Bayada said something about we need to learn how to agree to disagree again, Um, because we've become so incredibly divisive. Polarized, uh, polarized is now a buzzword, right? We talk about how polarized we are today. Let's stop doing that. Like, stop emotionally reacting to things. Um, be passionate about what you what you think and believe in and stuff, but but understand that that other people have their own things that they're passionate about. We all don't have to be vying for the same thing. Um, and so, I think we need to remove these labels as much as we can. Try our best. You know, it's going to happen regardless, right? We all are tribal. We all, you know, fight for our home team, um, but so does everyone else. So I, I think that this whole turning things into a war between us versus them, 
uh, and realize that when it really comes down to it as individuals, we are all doing what we think is right. So I think that's all I really want to say about this. I hope that um, anyone who watches this, they understand that we're trying to communicate what it is we're trying to communicate here. We're not trying to be against anyone specific. We're trying to present a, we are trying to present a specific perspective in hopes that people can be a little bit more charitable with their interpretation of uh, what the information they're being given. Um, and one final thing, this should go without saying, but obviously we are not scientists. We are we are not medical experts. We are just talking about um, uh, once again. I've said a bunch of times, but her experience with uh, the vaccine, and uh, like everyone else, we we talk about our perspective in some capacity and relay some information that we have from sources that we've read. Right, so. Um, I want to thank Bayana for being on the podcast um, to everyone here because, as you can see, it's it's been a, a challenging time for her, and this is, um, you know, we had a couple conversations about what this episode will look like. So, um, thank you, Bayana. And without any further delay, here is my conversation with Bayana Moon. My name is Alan Kanaw, and I am a collaborative composer. Join me in the search for a career in classical music. This is the Making Noise podcast. I'm incredibly honored that you're you're here, and 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 in this wild time that we've been going through, you know the pandemic and the quarantines, and we're still having this crazy fluctuation and stuff, but. I found, Beata, I found out about you as we, we've been talking. I found about, out about you through the NPR article. And uh, I don't remember exactly what the title was, but it had something to do with like New York City composer, um, something with adverse effects with the vaccine. And I read the article and I was incredibly touched and um, concerned like for you, but also for our community the global community in the reaction that has been that you've been receiving and stuff like that. So I was hoping maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience, what led to that article, maybe what sort of things you're experiencing now. Well, thanks so much, Adam. And I really appreciate you reaching out and being open to hearing my side of the story. And thank you to whoever might be watching. Thank you for listening as well. Um, I got so many emails from people after that story aired. It was first on the radio and then it, there was a digital story later, but so many people thanking me for speaking out because they were going through similar situations, having adverse effects and being afraid to say anything because of the fear of being vilified. and. I'm not really on social media, which I'm happy about because I, when I looked on someone else's Facebook to see um, responses, there were a lot of not nice responses. And it made me think about how, you know, social media in general is not really a healthy place to spend too much time on. And also just like about like young people and and I'm not saying like these people who said the not nice comments, they're bad people because, you know, I think on social media, it's just so easy to be mean and to just pile on someone and make assumptions without really knowing everything. Because like I spoke to the reporter for like over an hour and this was like a five minute segment. So hopefully people will try to remember that any news or story is just condensed and it doesn't really tell the whole picture. But um, so I just, I mean, the one, one of the messages that I hope will come out of our talk is that, you know, for people to just try to have more of an open mind and to not make assumptions and to be kind to one another, to themselves, and also to the planet, because we really need to do that. That's something else that I'm really concerned about. And 
I also just want to plug, um, if you haven't seen the Netflix documentary, The Social Dile Dilemma, have you seen that? I have, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's also, I think, um, Tristan Harris, who was part of that movie, and he was on Google. He has this um, organization called the Center for Humane Technology that is trying to make tech more, you know, not so toxic. And he wrote this article in the Times a couple of years ago, and he quoted this um, Edward Wilson, who is a renowned father of sociobiology. And, you know, he was asked whether humans would be able to solve the crisis that would confront them. And his response was, the real problem is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike tech, which I think sums it up so well that like, you know, and, and we're in such a time right now where we're going through this trauma, like everyone is struggling. There's so much fear and anger and pain and loss. And so I understand people's like strong reactions, but I really just hope, you know, for the sake of our humanity and our planet that we can find some more middle ground. So um, I was, I wrote, I heard on NPR a story from the same reporter like a few months back talking about those who were refusing to get vaccinated. And, you know, it interviewed a few people, but it ended with this woman saying, oh, God told me not to get the shot. And to me, it, I just felt like that's really just telling one side of the story of why someone might not get fully vaccinated or vaccinated. I felt nowadays um, the narrative is so narrow, either if you're in the left or the right, it's like either conspiracy and microchips or, you know, um, everyone who doesn't ag agree is like anti-vax and whatever. So there's no, there's not a lot of middle ground. And so I wrote to her and I said, you know, I appreciate the article. I didn't think you really covered everybody who's not, who's hesitant, vaccine hesitant. And I, you know, explained a little bit my situation and also that I have come to know many people who have experienced really adverse effects from the vaccine. And I think anyone in science and any doctor or scientist will tell you there's always adverse effects from any kind of drug. That's what they'll say. And it's dependent upon about, you know, like supposedly it's a lower amount, you know, or the risk benefit. But um, so she got back to me and she wanted to hear more of my story. And then later asked me, well, can we do a story on you? <laughs> and I was um, hesitant at first, but the reason I agreed was because I feel like, or there, because I know that there are so many people who are suffering from these adverse effects. Like mine is so not severe compared to some people who are really still suffering from neurological um, effects. And mine is nothing compared to that. But, you know, so I wanted to hopefully, and I told her like, are you gonna mention the people with adverse effects? Or like, I wanted to make sure that was somehow incorporated and that it, it, would, it would hopefully open people's minds. So that's what you know, that was why I wanted to do it. And she's like, oh, I'd love, I'd love to hear you play. You know, you know, she, you know, asked me to do that. And so, you know, I thought I had COVID in January of 2021 because my sense of smell was altered and I was smelling cigarettes when it wasn't there. And I took a PCR test and it was negative. And then when I got my first Moderna, which I really was looking forward to, my husband and I were like, yay, we finally got an appointment because it was so hard to get mm -hmm. in the early days. It was so hard to get an appointment. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, as she reported, um, that, you know, I was feeling like I was going to black out. And I thought, oh, I'm just getting Zoom fatigue because I was on the computer a lot. And, but the uh, day when I, in the middle of the night, when I woke up so dizzy and nauseous, like I was afraid I would fall if I stood up. And it was mostly dizziness, like the tinnitus didn't come back as prominently until the relapse. So like initially it was dizziness with a little bit of ear ringing, but you know, fatigue. And so I 
you know, my husband had to take me to the urgent care because I couldn't even like walk really. And they did all these tests and they said, oh, you have COVID. And I was just like shocked because I've been super, super careful. Like anyone who knows me, like I hardly was in public places. I wore masks. I didn't, I don't, you know, it's, it's really puzzling and frustrating when you think you're doing everything and then like you still get it. But um, so that dizziness, like I did go online, you know, like dizziness, COVID vaccine or COVID. And I did find this um, vestibular forum of people just trying to find um, remedies for what they were going through. And this is not like, an, this is not an anti-vax. This is not a conspiracy. Most of them are just like, oh, I'm going to get my second shot or I had my booster. You know, like they're, they're, everyone there is just like, wait a minute, I'm feeling dizzy too. Or I have this ear ringing too, or, or my muscles twitching, or I suddenly have these incredible headaches that I never had before. And, um, you know, people made the assumption from that five minute segment that I did not consult medical professionals, which is not true. I have, you know, I have medical notes that, you know, I, I submitted to my places of work and they were all very sympathetic, even the HR, very understanding. Because by that time, when I had the relapse, so I got better a little bit, but when I had a relapse in the summer, that's when the ear ringing came back more, like not so much the dizziness, but the ear ringing. And it's not like debilitating, I'm very grateful. It's like, I know some people have it constant. For me, it comes and goes, but I'm just afraid that it will get worse because I've read of so many um, stories of people getting, having their tinnitus worse. And I'm not 100% sure it's from the vaccine. Like I, it could be from COVID, it could be my age, I don't think it's because I'm a musician, because I'm a classical musician, I'm a pianist, I haven't been in rock bands, I'm not sitting near the percussion, <laughs> like I haven't really been in loud environments, so I don't think that's why. But I mean, it could be, you know, my age or having had COVID, but there are many people and there are studies being done that link, or are still being done, they're trying to figure out, because no one knows anything for sure, you know, that are trying to, that are trying to figure out, well, what is this, why are all these people reporting tinnitus after the vaccine? when they hadn't experienced it before. And after this article, you know, a couple of people said, you know, well, I had tinnitus before the vaccine and it got worse or it changed after the vaccine. And, you know, a musician wrote, other musicians wrote me and one said like, I lost hearing in one ear after the second shot. So like people would just assume that I immediately just, you know, like they were like, doesn't she know it's from COVID? <laughs> like, I mean, I don't think anyone knows for sure anything because science is supposed to evolve and, you know, we're still learning new things. And um, so, I mean, my inclination is that I do think it is from the vaccine just because from the dizziness and from learning about all these people who are still suffering from adverse effects. And, and I actually wanted to convey like that these strict one size fits all mandates are really hurting people. I mean, I, I thought that was going to be more of the message, you know, that, you know, why can't there be more flexibility? Like if someone has natural immunity, which I still don't understand why here in the US, it's not given more um, credit because, you know, our bodies are amazing things. And, you know, I think science is trying to copy what the immune system can do. And, um, you know, I've been in dialogue with, um, Infectious, infectious disease person, a virologist, like I have cousins who are doctors, um, which reminds me, I, I mentioned to you, Z Dog MD is a doctor who goes online and he's very alt middle. And I appreciate a lot of his viewpoints because it's more nuanced. It's not just like right or left, but he kind of covers all of it. And she recommended him. And he talks about natural immunity. Why is, why is this you know, press for vaccine passports. Why not immunity passports? Because I still have that immunity. I actually just got my antibodies tested recently in December and I still have moderate to strong. So like with one dose and um, a natural immunity, that's like equivalent to two doses of, you know, vaccine. But, um, and feel free to stop me at any point. No, no, I, 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 what you're saying is I'm, yeah, I want, I want you to keep on your flow. You're, yeah. on, you're on a nice flow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot that I, so I mean, um, so I guess, and I appreciated you getting your email because you're giving me a chance to say more of what, you know, wasn't 
explained. And, and I, I also, I really fear for the push to booster um, and even vaccinate like young children and young healthy adults because there have been studies where the myocarditis is more risky from the vaccine for young men and boys than it is from COVID. And we just don't hear that though, you know, in mainstream media. So I just want people to be healthy and to just be careful. Like if, you know, if you had the booster or if your child has had the shot, just be super aware of like, don't dismiss any kind of like, why do I feel that way? Like, don't just think it's all anxiety. Like if you like have heart palpitations or, you know, just be aware of the symptoms and don't just put it off because there have been a lot of instances where healthy young people have heart problems now. And so yeah, I, think I wanted to talk about it more. The, uh, I'm, I'm so glad with so much of what you said and, and thank you for, for explaining things like that. Um, and as you mentioned, like to everyone who watches or listens to this, what we're attempting to do here is provide a middle, like you said, a middle ground, like a middle perspective and also sh try to hopefully, I don't know, like I'm not a wizard or any sort of, you know, um, uh, what's the word, like influencer or like guru, whatever you want to call it, I don't know. But um, hopefully that people can at least remain open-minded because like, like you said, with the vaccines alone, right? on the whole they're 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 mostly safe like they're they're very safe but the risk isn't zero right like there are people who are affected by it right and the thing is if you force them you know like take away their work or it's just it's wrong because they're not unsafe to people especially people who have had covid like i can sympathize for the frontline workers who don't you know, didn't want to get vaccinated because they've had a lot of them had COVID, they have natural immunity, and that's, you know, not being counted. And in many places in Europe, you can either show proof of immunity or vaccine, you know, immunity from natural immunity or from the vaccine, but not just solely the vaccine, which is still like even the booster is only f from the first formula. I think it was alpha or whatever. And the Two FDA vaccine excerpts experts <laughs> resigned, I think, after the push for boosters because they were saying boosters for all is not the way to go necessarily. Like, yes, if you're immunocompromised or you know you're older, like, or if you're obese or if you have diabetes, there's certain factors. But to just press it on young people and kids, and I just feel like with this booster that is still the formula from the original, I mean, the main variant that they made the vaccine for. And, you know, I'm no medical expert at all. I've just been trying to read and learn and have dialogue with different people and different opinions. And I just, you know, I feel like we need to respect people's um, choices and especially people like when you read or hear their stories where because they were forced to get another shot because of work and now they're incapacitated and yet because the cdc's guidelines like for side effects are so limited like it doesn't even list dizziness or tinnitus like it's just headache or you know fever like and because of that like even though my supervisors were all sympathetic it was the legal departments of the organizations like oh well according to cdc you know we can't well you know we we defer to the cdc which has such limited guidelines and it's it's hurting so many people and it, it just makes me fear you know people are going to lose trust i mean there's already a lack of trust but it's going to further erode trust in you know health policy and government and absolutely i i i really think um what you said how you said you're you're reading things you're trying to educate yourself right yeah i think it's important that people recognize like anyone who listens to this and might be critical we're all trying to understand this we're all reading things and going back to what you said about the social dilemma this is where that connects in is that our phones and everything as we know 
is completely curated to what we would want to see. Also, the things that would tip us off to getting pissed or something. Right. Right. Which is pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all like anything that any of us reads, don't assume that you don't have a bias. Right. <laughs> right. Like, we all have our biases. We're going to, you know, um, like many of us do, we'll see a headline and be like, what the hell? But then never read the article. Right. Right. Or even if we read the article, we're not exactly reading exactly, you know, um, we're not. Or we jump to conclusions or make assumptions without right. really knowing the full story. And like you said earlier, too, is that um, journalists have a job where they need to compile this information into a concise way. But at the same time, journals need to sell articles and stuff, right? right. So there's headlines that are going to be put out there that are more eye-catching and make people want to read or right. click or whatever and so um i only say this just for everyone to have this in mind that like you know one can quickly jump to conclusions like you said earlier about oh well this is an anti-vaxxer i don't need to hear that it's like that's not that's not the scenario right and 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 your your example right here is an example it's not um what, what do they call it? it's not an anecdote because at what point does an anecdote actually become a statistic? Exactly. I mean, and what they say, when is it, when is it coincidence? How can you prove causal? Which I understand, but supposedly there are many signals out there about um, how this affects certain people. Like I've been reading how those who had prior COVID, like so many people might have had, might have had asymptomatic COVID, but that even a first dose could. Uh, it gets a tr it activates a immune response within your body. Like it's all about your immune system, like going haywire, mm -hmm. and that like um, if you had um, like some people on this forum, like they had vestibular, they had dizziness issues before, but that got reactivated, you know, after when it was dormant for like years and years. And same thing, like people who had Lyme disease, or then they realized they had Lyme disease. Like it just there's just um, so many things we don't know about it still and that it does affect certain people i'm glad it's you know it's not a majority of people but those people that it's affecting you just cannot we just want to ignore or don't want to deal with because you know it's easier to say like no it's easier to be black and white good bad <laughs> when most of the time there's just too much gray area and it's it takes more work and effort because then we'll have to be like oh I have to really think about it and I can't just label that person and put that person, you know, off or dismiss that person. It takes more work to, to, to be in the gray, more nuanced area. That's a really good point. It, it, it does take a lot more work to, yeah, to put yourself in that position where you're willing to concede or um, is concede the right word or right? concede an argument. I think so. I mean, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, see, yeah. <laughs> I understand what you're saying. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we don't like to be wrong. No one yeah. likes to be wrong. And also um, we're incredibly tribal, you know, like yeah. confirmation bias really does allow us to, um, to, to just stay in, in whatever it is that we believe without, right. without um, confronting anything that might be otherwise or I think, feeling like we, we should. Right. And because right now we are all so overcome with fear, which I understand, like, I mean, and I think fear is like, just makes us become tribal because like, it's just like a protective thing. And, um, and the thing is we are, I, uh, I meant to write down this, I think it's Nikki. Oh, I forgot the name of the poet, but she was saying we should all be earthlings, you know, stop with this race, gender, everything. We're human beings. We're earthlings, you know, and um, we're all in this together. Like people forget that vax, anti-vax, I think we can all safely say that we all want this pandemic to end. Everyone does. We all want to be healthy. We all want to be safe. People have different opinions. Like they're even like they're, you know, I've been told, oh, the science says this or doctors say this, but actually, like, the science is still evolving. You know, the science they're still figuring out. And there are many scientists and doctors who don't agree with the mainstream media, but they are considered fringe now because of the need to have this strict narrative. And there is a range, you know, like, it, it is hard. And 
you know, like with the social dilemma, I think they're saying it's so hard now with social media that we don't have a shared truth. Like today's January 6th, you know. With, oh, yeah. You know, there's, there's no shared truth about so many things. And, you know, how do we find common ground and how do we find the middle, I feel like. And, but I think, you know, there's so much pain and anger and just fear and loss that like the one thing that I'm learning, like the first thing towards healing is to name what it is. Mm. So like, you know, naming that this is so frustrating or so angering and, but don't try to just like put it all on who you think, oh, well, she's anti-vax, it's all her fault, <laughs> you know, or like, you know, it's just easier to just like find someone to dump it on, but I don't think that's necessarily, it's not gonna solve the problem. It could actually make things worse. Like if you keep alienating people who, you know, there's so much division already, like, and also with the planet, like we, the extreme weather is not, going to discriminate although i think the global south like those countries where there's drought they're going to be suffer more unfortunately first but like we've been seeing it with the fires and the floods and everything it's like we have to come together as earthlings as human beings to really address this and instead of like our country and their country or our state and your state you know it, it's just in order for us to move forward we really need to find middle ground Oh man, that's so true. I I'm so glad that you're uh, <laughs> you're laying it out in that way. I mean, um, the the majority of the people like this this podcast it's a it's a music podcast, right? So, like I said in the in the beginning, that I, my hope is that you know the the people who this reaches who are mainly musicians, like we recognize that commonality between us is that we're all musicians. Right. You're a musician who has this situation that leads to some level of suffering right um but then there are also a lot of friends of mine and people who i know that aren't musicians that still listen to this right and and so uh, there's but the thing is too is i would argue that most of us like music those who don't something's wrong but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> unless they can't hear you know or they're sure, sure. hearing impaired and maybe <laughs> they can feel the vibrations <laughs> maybe they enjoy vibrations then you know? and um, it's kind of interesting that like you know, so many of the people who emailed, like I had a few who were questioning, but most of them were supportive. And um, a lot of them musicians saying like, I don't know what to do if they're going to, if they're, they're going to demand the booster or, and at the same time, like when I looked on Facebook, I saw many musicians also just saying really not nice things about, right. you know, so, and I mean, even in the music world, the new music world, before there was like uptown, downtown. I mean, there's still like, there were more, I don't know, there's still divisions between different styles of music and, you know, compositional styles. And it's like, why can't we just respect each other and our differences and try to learn more about each other? But that That is, um, there's something that's really ringing in my ear right now, and it's the term inclusivity. Right? Yeah. Inclusivity is a very big term, especially in our field right now. Right. And it feels entirely exclusive to me when people are very dismissive. Shaming is a word for the last like seven years that's been like used in every way to say you shouldn't shame. Right. But yet bullying has been a tactic that's been so common, and which is also like shaming. Yeah. You know, in, in this sort of, ex you know, sort of instances and stuff. And so... I hope people start like what you're saying, you know, um, like think about that a little bit before yeah. you. And the thing is, it's like, if you really do want change, like shaming or forcing them is not going to have change. Like, it's you know, so like, away. exactly. If you're just going to dump or, you know, get rid of your emotions and like, you know, that's one thing. But if you really want, you know, to work things out, shaming or forcing people is doesn't lead to understanding. Like it, that's just never works. And that's why there's so many like, policy people who are are questioning like why these vaccine strict one size fits all policies like why take away the testing or i mean like it's just so much you know and you know like even with immunity the natural immunity like with omicron south africa it hit there first i think it's like 25 percent vaccinated there but mostly everyone was fine and mild like 
because they had natural immunity. I mean, that's saying something for natural immunity there. And that, um, you know, here you see in the news, oh, cases, cases. But like, what about, I mean, finally, I think they're talking about, well, cases doesn't mean hospitalization right. are so increasing or deaths are so increasing. Like even in New York City for the pedi pediatric hospitals, I think when they needed to justify that the New York City schools stay open, they finally said, oh, well, when we said, when we said childhood pediatric cases were four times greater, it started at 12 and now it's at 50. And they said it to try to get people to vaccinate. And they didn't specify if people who were kids who were admitted were there because of COVID or they incidentally tested after there because they always test everyone for COVID mm -hmm. once they're admitted. So they even acknowledge like, oh, yes, you know, we have from 12 to 50. Yeah, that's four times. But if you just hear four times the rate it was what it was and you don't know the original number, it just scares people. And that, that's a, that's a really important point, I think, is that you'll yeah, you'll see exactly that. Oh, there's however many thousands of cases. But then what isn't mentioned is like, well, are the people who have those cases immunocompromised? Are there comorbidities involved? What right. is the age when there's kids involved? Do they have, you know, um, these pre-existing conditions right. that would lead to that? Right. And most cases with kids who are healthy, they're fine. Like their natural immunity is so much stronger and better. And um, I was just going to say something and I forgot, but maybe it'll come back to me. That's okay. But, it happens to um, me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> just because, oh, um, no, I don't know. Just with Omicron. Oh, with when they say, oh, you're being selfish or like, there isn't, I, I would like to see the data showing how unvaccinated, like, because they say the vaccinated also spread, like, just because you're vaccinated and boosted, you're, like, I know people who are boosted and still got Omicron. I know, like, we know the breakthrough infections, and at first they said it was so rare, rare, but that makes me question, is it really rare? Because I just know so many people who've gotten it, you know, it makes you question because they're not transparent, like, be transparent about the adverse effects, be transparent, it's like informed consent tell people of what the risk is and for people's own health, you know, what their issues are, they can decide because the, they're saying, they're making it like the unvaccinated are so like evil and spreading this um, disease when it's not the case, especially now with Omicron where both vaccinated and unvaccinated like are spreading. Mm -hmm. And even with Delta, I think that was a case. And um, it's just, you know, like what you said, the shaming and the, vilifying them is not helping anything that's exactly the thing like you just said um people saying it's it's selfish that you're not getting the vaccine and stuff it's like that attitude right there i i totally understand that people are thinking in terms of the collective of the you know we the people as a whole um but, but even scientists don't even agree on that. Right, like, you know, right. <laughs> like not everyone does. Exactly. Yeah. And and approaching things in that way, like you said earlier, um, like in like trying to force someone into something isn't going to is going to make them less likely to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to create more vaccine hesitancy and like in the future or just I just, um, you know, and democracy, we're such in a fragile place right now, I feel like. And this is not helping <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. like these mandates do not help and and even the censorship like or just you know the 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 either the extreme right or the extreme left there's just similarities in how the extremes um vilify each other mm -hmm. and don't give one another a chance like so some of the adverse um people aff aff affected adversely they went on a panel uh, by Senator Ron Johnson, who I am not a fan of. And actually the only um, thing that I appreciated was that he's giving these people with adverse effects a voice. Mm -hmm. But like people I know, friends, like would not even look at it because, oh, well, that's Ron Johnson, that's conspiracy. Like they won't even give it a chance, even though they were credentialed doctors from Stanford, from MIT, from Harvard, like people, and people telling their stories, like they, they just assume that um, it's all conspiracy theory. And it's unfortunate because I think a lot of the other things that he does, you know, with the, the, the elections are not, you know, like his motives could be political opportunism, right. but certain things you just can't just block out everything, you know, like they're, 
there could be like certain truths everywhere, you know, like everyone is just, um, you know, not giving anyone a chance, just completely shutting the door. And, and same thing even with cancel culture. I find that to do the similar thing, like, oh, that person said that one thing, or immediately, let, let's just deplatform. You know, that also is, is not helpful at all, I don't think, to, to finding common ground. That's, yeah, the, the such a, like, un, uncharitable way of interpreting things, that you, you see something or hear something that someone says or does, and you immediately go to the worst case scenario. Right. You don't and, give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and this is sort of that conversation of intent versus impact, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I'm of the mind that intent always matters. Of course, impact matters, too. Right. But you right. can't disconnect it. Right. Um, and you can't just um, just, you know, ignore the intent, like if it was not intentional, but it, I know it made an impact, but you just can't ignore that it wasn't coming from a place, you know, right or evil or whatever or malice you know so. I, ha I had a weird scenario once i was in a um it wasn't it was a car accident in the sense that my car was damaged but i was driving down a country road in new jersey like through farms and stuff and i saw a deer on this other side of the road and it was just kind of standing there and i was like kind of like uh i should probably slow down <laughs> like maybe 45 miles an hour and then the car come the other way last minute the deer jumps out <gasps> and hits the car hits the deer oh no deer goes up in the air lands on the hood of my car oh my gosh um it's not a pretty story i'm not going to finish the rest oh, of that gosh. Like, you know but um i get out of the car i was fine i was a little frazzled but i, I looked yeah. over and the woman the woman who hit the deer was like walking over to me and i was like are you okay and she was just crying and came over and gave me a hug oh and like in that situation i, I was like oh, this is bizarre but like I, I, I yeah like I this woman has a you know um she she's so emotionally yeah overwhelmed that you know and I sort of thought about it later and I was like in that situation I don't not that it was justified but like I could have gotten frustrated or mad right. like why why right. did you not why weren't you paying yeah. attention right? right and um I'm also in no way trying to paint myself as some beautiful human no. right it's just <laughs> I draw, you draw on your own experiences, right? Uh -huh. um, and so like, I think in examples like car accidents or like even with kids, like siblings fighting, you know, and the parent will be like, you know, telling them to stop. And right. then, oh, she hit me. What, why, yeah. did, why did she hit you? What did you, what, what happened? And then uh -huh. it's like, oh, well, I took this from her. And it's like, yeah. well, don't, don't do that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Yeah, so I mean, like uh, these aren't great examples. I'm not exactly laying out a beautiful. No, analogy. I understand <laughs> what you're saying. I mean, that there's so much misunderstanding. We make so many assumptions, and we all carry our biases. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard. The thing is, like, I feel like the to, we need to start with a self. We have to look inward first. Like, what are my biases? You know, and then also try to it's hard to do and i'm still working on this but like how to separate or try to see in those instances like why is this like especially like you know i work with kids a lot through teaching artist work which you can talk about too <laughs> at some point yeah. um but just you know um that like you know sometimes your buttons can be so pushed you know and then it's like wait a minute okay how am i feeling right now and what's going on and it's hard to like not suddenly immediately act out upon our feelings because I feel like this society and most cultures were taught like, oh, just be happy and you know, everything is great. Like, don't be sad, don't be angry. Like, uh, like certain feelings are not acceptable, but as human beings, we have this range of emotions and um, if we don't acknowledge them, they're just gonna keep popping up like, mm -hmm. like that whack-a-mole like if you're sad and hurt or anger and like, oh no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. It's just gonna come up in another way. And and I think like we need to learn to be aware of how we're feeling. Like, oh my gosh, that's making me really angry. Am I gonna push that, like press the angry emoticon like right away or whatever, you know, impulse, you know, to do? Or am I gonna think for a moment and just take a pause? And it's just like, 
but in order to do that, you have to be aware of yourself and how you're feeling and then acknowledge like, it's okay to feel angry, but I'm not going to act out on it. Like we don't have that distinction. Like people are afraid like, oh my gosh, if I'm sad, I'm just going to be depressed all the time. Or if I'm angry, I'm going to like do something bad. Well, that's where I find music for me as an outlet. Like if I'm angry or upset or happy, like, or any artist, or, or even if you're an athlete or whatever, like finding another creative outlet to release our emotions rather than I'm going to, you know, do something violent or, you know, so. Yeah, have some sort of reactionary response. Yeah. Um, this is this is actually a perfect way to to mention this book right here. Can you oh, see right, that? the Righteous Mind. Yeah, I started reading that. Thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I've I've mentioned it several times on this podcast <laughs> because clearly it's always necessary. <laughs> yeah. Um, what you're saying right now is one of the first concepts he talks about in this book, which he calls. Um, he says. Intuitions come first, strategic reasoning comes second. Uh -huh. And one of the things he gets at with that point is what if you make some if you say some sort of argument like, oh, people are dying from corn, whatever. And then I'm a corn farmer uh -huh. or something like that. And I'll be like, what are you talking about? No, yeah. Not. <laughs> and right. then and then you're like, well, these studies show this. And then yeah. And then my reaction to that would be to go through some sort of reasoning process to prove why my emotional response is right. Uh -huh. Even when I know I'm wrong, uh -huh. you know? And so um, uh, that's such an important thing to mention. We all yeah. do it too. Like, we're, yeah. like I've read this book maybe two or two and a half times. I still do it. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know. I mean, I think like what that social biologist said about with our paleolithic emotions, like we're just still like, we're just wired to just react. And in mm -hmm. the medieval institutions that still don't know how to like create flexible common sense policies a lot of the time. And then this tech, which is scary, which, as you said, like, I think they said, if you Google climate change, depending upon what you've put in before, if you live in a blue state or red state, it'll either come up with, you know, hoax or, you know, global warm, you know, something that it will just feed, like, so we're in these echo chambers and, um, and yeah, it's hard to, and because of this pandemic and all this trauma, like we're, we're all experiencing, like, there's been so much loss, like, you know, work, not loss of life. Like, I mean, there's loss of the way, you know, we used to be in the world. And I know for some people, like, I wouldn't want it to go back to the way it was, because I don't think that the way it was, was we need to do better than that. You know, mm -hmm. now that we've learned about so many th issues, like, but, you know, there is a loss there and it's, it is frustrating and it's, I feel like we have to go through this mourning, like this, you know, acknowledge that we still are going through this, but, you know, separating and othering and piling on other people is not going to help us. And, and especially with the earth and the climate and with the climate crisis, like, it's just going to get worse. And I feel like resilience is a word now that um, I f we need to learn and teach our children and ourselves because I think being resilient is being able to adjust and adapt to the situation like you know Omicron like hopefully what they're saying it's going to become an endemic right. like the cold like the flu virus where it's not going to kill as many people you know the flu kills people too it's just that never to you know not like to the extent so um you know, I just hope that we can all build resilience and more compassion. And um, yeah, I've just become like more involved, like with climate, like, uh, and just with my music, I think in general, for me, I just feel like it's, it has been an outlet has been helpful to me to find, you know, to use music as a way to express however I'm feeling. And whether it's music or writing or dancing or running or, you know, whatever, cooking, whatever people choose, I just hope they find more time to do that and less time on social media, <laughs> so, you know, so, and more time in nature and hopefully to try to, you know, acknowledge 
the the whole world. And I, I mean, I have a bunch of books. That's why I t I've been telling you, like, this is another one that I'm reading with Jane Goodall. With oh, yeah. Because, like, I, you know, she says, I mean, I, I, I'm in the very beginning, but still, um, you know, I don't know if it was her that said it, but someone said, <laughs> like, hope is like a muscle. Like, it's, you have to work at it. It's not like to be hopeful, like you, it's, it's something like to be resilient and to have hope, it, it takes work, just like mm -hmm. to be in the gray area and not just be black and white, you know, to, to make things better requires work. And, but I think that's also like self care, like kindness and giving grace to yourself and, and all like all the religions in the world share the same belief that, you know, treat others as you would like to be treated. Right. And that's just something like I feel like we need reminders, whether, you know, whatever religion, that's what they all share. So well, that's that's a really good and beautiful point. I mean, and I think it's something <clears throat> with this whole thing about like cancel culture and stuff that religions have, which none of this other stuff does, which is forgiveness. Yeah. Right. There's no right. room for even if you make a minute error or even if you make an error that is it's not an error, it's a perceived error. Right that there's no room for any you know like redemption or anything yeah or, or um a comeback or whatever you want to call it yeah. yeah and and also like that we put so much like everyone is human our our political leaders are human like people make mistakes and, and it's unfortunate like when they make mistakes and they don't acknowledge it because it's rare to have a leader who does that but like you know I think that's a really good point, like the forgiveness aspect and mm -hmm. just, you know, giving grace to others and yourself. I feel like people are, maybe people who are unforgiving of others, they tend to be unforgiving towards themselves too. Who knows, you know, like there's, you know, pain or anger or things that they're not dealing with within themselves that mm -hmm. make them less you know, generous to others, but that's such a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, 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 I'm curious about something we haven't talked about. And, and if, if you don't want to get into it, that's fine. But um, I think, ah, so the, the timer went off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so, so we're in our wind down period. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll throw the question out there, you can deflect it or, um, and or maybe just very briefly say something if you want, or, okay. you know, but um one thing that I think is all musicians can connect with is the fact that because you aren't fully vaccinated, it is affecting your work. Yeah. It is affecting your ability to make money as a musician. Right. In part and musicians have and written, at, written to me saying, I'm afraid my work is going to be affected if they require this booster or more, you know, and now the Metropolitan Opera and the New York Philharmonic are requiring boosters, which makes me really worried about people who may not need it. And, or if they had COVID, you know, even the colleges that are requiring it, like for mm. these young people, like, and, um, you know, I'm fortunate. Like, I feel very grateful. Like I'm, I still have some virtual work. It's definitely tapering off now that this new semester is here. And now that New York city before it had, one vaccine was enough now it's two so now that's like limiting more but you know i'm fortunate like my husband is working and he's not you know a, a musician but um i feel for musicians and everyone who's affected you know who are f having to make a choice between work and these inflexible mandates that are not really making people healthier or safer that are just creating more creating more stress and trauma you know, financial stress, who knows, are you going to make someone homeless that way, you know, like, or the mental, emotional stress, or if that person has family, I mean, it's just, it's doing more harm than good, I think. And I know that, um, I mean, it's, it's difficult enough for musicians, I think, you know, and freelance musicians, and even now in conservatories, we are, I think there's training, like, to how are you as an entrepreneur? Like, how can you expand? Because it's just not, I'm going to have this career, like either with commissions or performing, because that world is like gotten smaller and smaller. And, you know, and it's not even like, there's so much competition for entertainment, you know, that's not the way to go forward. And like, so for me and my 
particular path. Like I'm grateful that I discovered teaching artists work and it's not for everybody, but you know, when I first got into it, it was because I needed a job. I was like, Oh, music teacher. So it was like music teacher needed in the Bronx. And I have, I was at Juilliard. I took a leave of absence I needed work because I just needed to figure out what I wanted to do for myself. This was before I started composing. I was a piano major. And they it was a private school, it was a Catholic school, so I didn't have to be, you know, accredited. And she saw Juilliard, it's like, okay, great. I was like, okay, but it was such a learning experience. And oh my gosh, like I I'm proud of myself that I survived the entire year, but I learned so much. Like I had made so many assumptions, like, oh, everyone knows what a melody is, everyone knows about this. And and it just made me research like, oh, not everyone has that same, you know, music background or access to music. Like I, growing up, there was choir, or glee club, like I had, there were music programs, you know, that's not the case in every school nowadays, you know? And um, so that, and then I also helped, I got into composing as well, but just that, you know, so teaching artist work for me is just a way that I find like, and I find like, I'm becoming just more involved and activist, just, you know, about the climate, about just everything, like the inequities, the, you know, everything that's going on right now. And, um, but people, I think, um, so for me, music has kind of been an expression of that, or like, how can I use music for social change? Mm -hmm. And that's what I feel like teaching artist work is really about. Um, not just, you know, and that's my definition of it. I don't think there's one set definition, but, um, but I think for musicians, like everyone needs to find out and ask him or herself or themselves, like what, um, you know, what work is going to work for you? Because like I, I grew up thinking, oh, I'm going to be a classical concert pianist, like, you know, Vladimir Horowitz or whatever, <laughs> you know, and, and that like in going to Juilliard and realizing like, oh, my gosh, everyone is so good. Like that path wasn't making me happy and it's not what I would want to do, you know? So I think we definitely need to expand on what it is. And I think now people, like they say, people have left the workforce either because they don't want to get vaccinated or they're realizing, you know, they have more flexibility or they're having more time at home. They don't want to commute, you know, there's people like really rethinking what they want to do with their lives. So hopefully, you know, we can have a more, um, a work flexible work environment so that people can either work from home or can, you know, having a podcast or, you know, doing virtual sessions, you know, it, it can be hybrid. It doesn't, I think there are some positive things like a zoom, at least you could have people all over the world attending, even though one-on-one -on -one, you can't replace that, but you know, how can reimagine like, so using our imagination to imagine different possibilities. Um, and I think as artists and musicians, like, we can do that, but, um, so did I answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I thought, Absolutely. I think that was a, a beautiful way too, to sort of, you know, come to a, a, a nice close, honestly, it felt, it feels, you know, it was really optimistic and, and, um, you know, positive. Uh, and I think all of us need that, you know? Well, thank you. Adam, and I do appreciate, again, all that you're doing and like, again, for giving me a chance to talk more than a, you know, a five minute clip. And, um, you know, I appreciate your, all that you're doing. So, and I think I'll just say one last thing that one thing that I've been trying to incorporate more is just to take deep breaths, which they do say like physiologically, like, you know, like I think if you exhale slower than your inhale, it does something to your vagus nerve or like it physiologically will calm you down. So like when you're like, you're feeling so emotional and or angry and it's hard, of course, if you're wearing a mask or out and about, <laughs> but like when you're able to, I, I try to take longer deep breaths and that's to, to help me stay less stress. And, you know, and there are things that people can do, like, you know, whatever keeps them healthy and sane and just, you know, the vitamin D3, like, why aren't people talking about that, that it boosts your immune system, you know, vitamin C and zinc and quercetin and just things to do about your health that, you know, I think 
you know, we shouldn't take anything for granted anymore. So um, hopefully we can all just reimagine a better future and better possibilities. So. Ah, so well <laughs> said, so well said. I, I'm, I'm so excited and uh, thank you so much for everything. Um, often I ask if there's any social media or anything that, that you would want to plug. <laughs> I admire so much that you don't, um, but is there a way that people could support you or anything, whether that's, I don't know if you have uh, concerts coming up or like oh, a program you're a part of? Or... Thank you. I mean, I, I want people to stay healthy and to, you know, try to keep an open mind I mean, I do have a SoundCloud. <laughs> I am on LinkedIn, but um, uh, no, I mean, I just, I, f I want people to look within because I feel like you have to start with the self first. So the more self-awareness and give yourself grace, be kind to yourself, be kind to others, be kind to this planet, the earth. Maybe that's just all I'll say so that if people can do that and that, you know, it's okay to disagree. Like, you know, we can agree to disagree, you know, mm -hmm. but can we go back to that? And, um, yeah. So that's great. It's, if there's one thing I, I, I am aware of, of our, of the new music community is that most of us are incredibly empathetic and caring and we have the capacity to do that. And, I, and yeah. I, to echo what you're saying that, um, I hope that we're able to harness that, you know, Thank but, you. Beata, thank you so much. Um, I hope that everything from here on out is uh, smooth sailing, shall we, shall we say? Thank you. Know? you. <laughs> Thanks thank so much. Absolutely.